of this rocket taking off and going up and doing the flip and then turning back. K3 EKH, VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria with the regular Friday night broadcast coming to you from the studios of EK3 CSJ in Murray uh, Warren South. Uh, just getting rid of that audio there, there's some noise coming out on 80 metres. Um, <laughs> good evening, everyone. Trust that uh, everybody is fine and doing okay. And, uh, oh, um, and uh, hopefully uh, there'll be audio uh, happening on all, all frequencies and all channels and that where it needs to be. Uh, I've uh, reintroduced the, the mixer tonight. It's been downstairs doing tests and um, anything could go wrong tonight but I think I've got it okay. And uh, try and keep an eye on that YouTube level too. I think it's a bit too much uh, audio on the, uh, on the YouTube stream. It's clicking into the red so I'll just knock that down a fraction. One, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, yep. Yeah. Okay, good evening everyone. And uh, on this uh, 3rd of March, 2023, uh, very pleasant uh, evening to uh, episode number, whatever it is for VK3 uh, EKH ASV radio broadcast here on all these frequencies. Uh, we're broadcasting prime frequency. Echo on ATV. Uh, there's what? No, what do you want ATV? There should be. Um, echo. Oh, Echo. What should there be? Echo. Um, let me just check the... 1212? Uh, 1212? No, yeah, there is two. Um, oh, I did check that a moment ago. It seemed alright. Um, I don't know what could be doing that. Uh, just got a little bit of uh, a reverb effect on the uh, TV. Verb effect on the uh, TV. I can't do that because it's going to make noise on 80. Arr, I don't know what's doing that. Um, we've got ATV back tonight um, after a yeah, long excursion of uh, no activity. And um, uh, so we're broadcasting through the Melbourne television repeater, the K3RTV. And that should be right. They're using the codec there, the four-speaker USB codec. It should be right. Um, 
I'll just give this a bit of a try. I'm just doing an on on air check here and seeing if that improves anything. Um, one, two, three, four. One, two, one, two, one, two. No. Yeah. All right. I was just going to the uh, SR codec, but I'll go back to the codec that runs the uh, off the, the um, uh, off the mixer. Uh, so uh, I don't know where else the delay could be coming in. Um, yeah, stand by, ladies and gentlemen. We'll just get this one, one, two, one, two. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. So fix it. Yeah, get rid of that echo. We're, we're, we're having to deal with delays on the on the TV system, which doesn't help things. One two. Oh, that seems to have fixed it. It's not as bad. At least you'll just have to put up with that because I don't think it's going. Yeah, I don't think it's going to wear on to uh, on HF one two from what I can hear here. I'm monitoring my HF feed. HF fine. Yeah. All right. Excellent stuff. <laughs> all right. Uh, this me. Anyway, good evening. VK three KH broadcasting on prime frequency of three five four one kilohertz in the 80 metre amateur radio band and uh, broadcasting through the Melbourne television repeater VK3 RTV digital channel number one so a pleasant wave to everybody there on, on the TV side of things and um, uh, I suspect there's a BATC feed I'm not 100% sure uh, if there's a feed to the BATC you might uh, check that um, we also have a prime email uh, address uh, VK3EKH at gmail.com uh, vk3ekh at gmail.com so uh, we're looking at the inbox as we speak and uh, the and uh, the BATC feed is good so if you're not uh, able to see me on uh, the Melbourne television repeater uh, you can certainly see us uh, on the BATC feed which is the British Amateur Television Club uh, feed and uh, that should uh, um, be working quite well uh, but you can also see us on, on uh, the YouTube channel that I have, uh, VK3CSJ, just type in VK3CSJ YouTube and look for the live symbol and uh, we'll be there, uh, unshaven and scruffy and looking. What was that? And screen And oh yeah, I was working on to that, I'm just going to have to turn the volume down on something. Um, oh, nearly tripped as I went. Oh, this is so professional. Um, <laughs> oh, God. All right. Well, wouldn't it bother you? Um, okay, and a, a very pleasant good evening to all the happy little fans that have gone to see Mr. Ed Sharon out there at the uh, stadium. My goodness me, there's such a craze over this one chap. I don't understand it. Uh, about the only thing that I do appreciate about the guy is he seems to do an ama amazing concert with just a guitar and his voice. I don't see the band, I don't see any any band. So if he can entertain the thousands just on his voice alone and the guitar, well, he's doing something bloody good. Nevertheless, <laughs> um, that's just a little plug for Mr. Sharon, I suppose. There's only one song I really like that he does. In fact, it's not him that does it, it's the, the, the group that does a cover version of... Um, uh, whatever it was. Yeah. Walk Off the Earth. There's a, there's a, a Canadian band called Walk Off, Walk Off the Earth, something like that. And they do a, an Ed Sheeran version of... Um, um, doesn't matter. Alright, let's get into uh, tonight. Uh, of course, being the first uh, part of the month, uh, we um, uh, have Sky Notes uh, presented by me. Uh, compiled by uh, uh, Tamitha, um, not Tamitha, she's coming up later, Tamitha, um, we've got a solar report from Tamitha, but this is Tanya Hill, who actually does the uh, solar, solar notes, and um, 
let's just quickly get to the sky notes well actually before i do what time is it yeah it might be just, i'll run through the, the usual things show because there might be newcomers actually that's listening tuning in tonight and what's all this nonsense so um the astronomical this broadcast uh, is uh, done on behalf of the asv the astronomical society of victoria which was founded in 1922 and uh, we have uh, well over 1600 members scattered about the place Membership of the Society is open to all persons with an interest in uh, astronomy and uh, the Society's objectives of course are to encourage the study uh, among the membership and provide the facilities, necessary facilities for being able to conduct uh, your own uh, observations and research. The, there are monthly meetings uh, that are held uh, on the second Wednesday of each month and um, meetings start at 8pm, the uh, Morlia Hall, National Herbarium, uh, Burwood Avenue, Melbourne, and uh, parking is available in Burwood Avenue, Dellsbrooks Drive, and the surrounding streets. Admission is free, and visitors are most welcome to those monthly meetings, second Wednesday of uh, each month. Privileges of membership include the right to uh, access the uh, uh, library, uh, which is also based at the Melbourne Observatory, um, and also to, re to receive the uh, regular magazine uh, called Crux, which contains articles, news, observing notes and the like, and the free provision of the Astronomical Yearbook, which is published yearly by the, uh, the uh, Society. Access is available to telescopes on members nights held regularly at the Melbourne Observatory and after the monthly meetings, depending on the weather. Um, the instruments uh, included to uh, view through are a 300mm equatorial reflector, a 300mm portable reflector, and there's also a 200mm refractor managed by the Royal Botanic Gardens. Um, the Society also has a number of 200mm reflectors available for short period loan, so members can try before you buy idea. Uh, members are also encouraged to make use of the Society's country property located near Heathcote, Dark Sky Site. Uh, there are a range of instruments available for members to use, <coughs> uh, the larger two uh, with appropriate training. And these range from 300mm uh, to 1000mm uh, in aperture. Uh, also located on the site is an 8.5 metre fully steerable radio telescope. Uh, which members can access with involvement with the radio astronomy section. Members are encouraged to make and use telescopes. Advice and help on both matters are provided willingly to newcomers desiring to do the same. Instrument making is only one of the number of common interest activities catered for within the society. Uh, other areas of interest that members can participate in include deep sky observing, astrophotography, lunar and planetary observing, Auroral, Meteor, Comet and Radio Astronomy, Computing Section, Cosmology, Astrophysics, Historical Studies and Research in Astronomy in general. Contact details for various section directors are provided in the yearbook, but if you don't have the yearbook because you're not a member of the ASV, all that information uh, for contact details for various section directors and, and the like can be found from the ASV website at www.asv.org.au. That's www.asv.org.au Or if you like, you can write to the Secretary, Astronomical Society Victoria, GPO Box 1059, Melbourne, Victoria 3001, while um, post uh, is still occurring. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, alright, that's the, uh, the usual thing out of the way. Um, I've run out of coffee, so the next option is a cup of tea. Tea works, but I prefer coffee. Um, okay, so Sky Notes. So you tune to ASV Radio, the K3 Echo Kilo Hotel, been running since 1988. Well, I haven't, but uh, the station has here on this uh, frequency on uh, this band uh, for all that time. Sky Notes, March 2023. Let's just see where it all starts here. Autumn Equinox. This month, uh, on Tuesday the 21st, 
we have almost equal lengths of day and night, uh, the equinox, when Earth's axis leans neither toward nor away from the sun. We are midway between summer and winter solstices. Uh, there's a little diagram below that kind of shows that, and I do have that picture selected. Um, let's see where I put that. Um, 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 um. Ah, okay, I didn't bring that across. But what I do have is this, um, and the audio stays there. That's good. All right, now this this is a uh, like a time time elapse thing uh, for those watching TV and uh, and video, uh, YouTube. Uh, before I kick that off, I'll just uh, continue to read this. Um, so, uh, what it is, which is on the video at the moment, because it paused, uh, to more fully appreciate equinoxes and solstices, uh, they say here is a, a remarkable time elapse sequence from NASA's Earth Observatory, uh, which shows our sunlit Earth from 2010 to 2011. So, it's a. Um, it's a time time elapsed sequence from NASA's Earth Obs Observatory from a fixed point in space um, between 2010-2011, and uh, let's see if I can just run this successfully within vMix. Um, there we go. Oh, amazing how that worked. Um, so there it is, and you can you can see how the Earth's axis is uh, altering the the way the Earth faces the Sun as we uh, go around. Let's see if I can just repeat that again. Um, it's uh, between 2010 and 2011 from a fixed point looking towards Earth, and you can you can just see how as we go from one equinox to uh, to another, just how um, how uh, the relationship to uh, the Sun, the, uh, the Earth's axis changes, which um, gives us our seasons. So. Um, I thought it was rather interesting to uh, to grab a hold of that, but apart from all that, um, uh, yeah. So twenty first Tuesday, the twenty first of uh, uh, of March, uh, we're looking at those um, uh, equinoxes and solstices and things. Melbourne Sun Times for those interested in sunrise and sunset times um, uh, on Wednesday the first. Been and gone. The sun rose at 7:03, set at 8 o'clock. Saturday the 11th, it'll rise at 7:13, setting at 7:45. By Tuesday the 21st, the sun will rise at 7:23, setting at 7:31. And by the end of the month, Friday the 31st, rise at sun will rise at 7:32, and set at 7:15 with the day length uh, um, going from 12 hours to 11 hours by the end of the month. Moon phases. Uh, there's a full moon on Tuesday the 7th. Uh, third, there's a third quarter on Wednesday the 15th. A new moon on the 22nd, Wednesday the 22nd. And then uh, by the end of the month back to, to a first quarter on Wednesday the 29th. Uh, the moon will be furthest from the Earth on Saturday the 4th, uh, tomorrow, at 405,889 kilometres, and uh, it will be a perigee closest to the Earth on uh, Monday the 20th at 362,696 kilometres. You could almost throw a stone at it. Uh, Mercury is about to move behind the Sun afterwards. Um, will be too close to be uh, to uh, to be seen this month as a result of that. Uh, Venus is visible early in the month, soon after 8 p.m. Uh, in the west at uh, at dusk before Saturday uh, by 9 p.m. Uh, it will be visible a little earlier each evening until uh, by late March uh, can be seen from 7:40 p.m. Earth experiences, as we mentioned, Earth experiences an equinox this month uh, here in the Southern Hemisphere. It will be autumn equinox on Saturday 20, 
uh, the sun will be seen rising almost due east and setting virtually due west. The term equinox comes from the ancient Latin equocom, uh, you have to believe me, uh, and then later uh, medieval equoxinum, Latin, I hate Latin words. On the 20th, uh, the axis of the Earth will be tilted 23.5 degrees from its orbital path around the Sun and will not lean away from it will not lean away from the Sun uh, um, as it does in winter, nor towards the Sun in summer. That's what it says. However, not being in the equatorial region uh, at Earth's uh, at Melbourne's latitude 37.8 degrees south, the equal day and night hours will occur a few hours later on Wednesday the 24th. Uh, this four-day delay is because the atmosphere bends or refracts light from the sun, allowing us to see the sun a little before it physically rises and, uh, and for a short time after it actually has set. Uh, after the autumn equinox, the sun daily path across the sky will shift northward and will be a little shorter each day over the next three months until we reach the mid-year winter solstice at which time our planet's axis will lean the southern hemisphere away from the sun. Mars can be seen in the north from 8.30pm before it sets around midnight. By the end of the month it will be visible from 8pm before dropping below the horizon by 11.30pm. Jupiter can still be seen early this month, er, very, er, sorry, very low in the west at dusk before setting. But mid-March it will have moved too close to and then behind the Sun and so it will be lost from view. Saturn will reappear from mid-month in the eastern sky before sunrise uh, at around 5.20pm and by the end of the month it will rise from 4.40pm before fading in the dawn light. The International Space Station orbits the Earth every nine, 90 minutes at the average a distance of 400 uh, kilometers appearing like a bright a bright star moving across the sky here are some bright passes uh, expected uh, this month over Melbourne uh, Friday the 3rd so this is probably already this has in fact um, <laughs> Friday the 3rd there was a passing at 9.06 p.m. to 9.11 but then tomorrow uh, Saturday the 4th, there's a passing at 8.17pm to 8.24pm, coming in from the southwest to the east northeast. Uh, in the morning, uh, that'll be impressive because uh, if Ed Sheeran is doing his uh, Saturday concert, I don't know if he's not, but I can just imagine the International Space Station flying over at an opportune time. Um, <laughs> if the sky is clear. Anyway, uh, then on the morning of Thursday the 23rd, uh, there's a passing at 6.14 a.m. through to 6.20 a.m. northwest to southeast. Heavens Above gives predictions for visible passes of space stations and major satellites, uh, live views, live sky views and 3D visualizations. Uh, be sure to be, uh, be sure to, to first enter uh, your location under the configuration file for accurate um, situations but the heavensabove.com website is, is a pretty good uh, website for uh, anything to do with um, what's up in the sky and where it is. G'day Don, um, g'day through HDX has just uh, sent us an email and uh, all very good for 80 meters, YouTube looks good, excellent, <laughs> thank you Don. Uh, email VK3. Turn off the audio for your camera. Ah, you're so, so you are. Oh, yes, I've got, I'm using the. Um, that's probably what's, what's going on. I'm using the uh, built-in microphone still. I haven't stopped that. Uh, very, very good observation. It's taken 21 minutes for that. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Because I'm not on the. Yes, I'm using the internal mics in the in the speaker. Okay. In the camera, not the speaker. Um, that's a bit of a trick right now. Um, don't think I can do it easily on the fly. Um, yeah, click, click the button in um, Vmix, the audio button. 
let me just have a look here we're just going to do a quick modification to the audio on the camera here um, yeah that's not going to do it um, do this because um, if I do that that just is oh, oh hang on uh, uh, am I is it has it fixed it has it oh okay <sighs> <All right. laughs> anybody who's used vmix understands um, all right so there we go um, we've uh, got that sorted I don't know why it's still working? Oh, they, oh okay. Let's throw the mix up. Okay. You're tuned to ASV Radio VK3 EKH, and we're getting stuck back into it. All right. So, Sky Notes continuing at uh, coming up to 24 minutes past the hour. Heavens Above. I was talking about Heavens Above, so there it is. <laughs> it's a great website. Uh, meteors. Okay. We've got a little bit of meteor activity happening. Uh, the Gamma Normids, they call them. The Gamma Normid meteor peak around the 15th of this month. They are centred near the sky, uh, sorry, near the star uh, Gamma Normae. Normi, Norma, Norma. Uh, the third brightest star in Norma. Uh, the level which lies between Scorpius and Centaurus. They are a major shower. And it would be best to look from midnight to dawn from a dark sky location. And uh, they provide a little link here to that too. But anyway, um, so they peak on the 15th of the month. And uh, let's just check what day that is. Um, so we're looking at a Wednesday. It's always midweek. Anyway, for those interested in doing... Um, uh, meteor scatter um, that would be probably an interesting time to uh, to look at that uh, stars and constellations let's hope the uh, the Latin is minimal in this um, Orion the hunter is north after sunset and upside down here in the southern hemisphere not sure why she always points that out um, I mean for us who for us people that live here in the southern hemisphere and and have studied the sky for a long time we 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 know how Orion looks um, it doesn't necessarily need to be pointed out that because we're in the southern hemisphere, it's upside down. It's it's, it's always been like that. Um, so, yeah. But anyway, with three bright stars forming Orion's belt, uh, or the base of the saucepan, uh, from our southern perspective, the fuzzy object in the centre of his scabbard, I think that's a sword, uh, which runs to the upper left, is M42. Uh, the Orion Nebula. Lower right in Orion is the red supergiant star Betelgeuse, uh, which has an obvious orangey-red colour. Uh, and to the upper left in the Orion is the blue giant star Regal. To the left of Orion and lower down is Taurus the Bull, my star sign. <laughs> its, head, uh, and, um, its head and inverted V. This is the open grouping known as the Hydes, um, uh, with a uh, uh, foreground red giant star Aldebaran and at the end of the open V. This month the red planet Mars is below and nearby. Uh, to the left in the northwest but lower down sits M45, uh, the beautiful Pallades cluster. Uh, over a thousand stars form the cluster uh, but at 444 light years, or, uh, only a few are bright enough to be seen with the naked eye. For some cultures, those few bright stars represent a group of women, and they are often referred to as the Seven Sisters. Uh, in New Zealand, the cluster is referred to as Matariki. Mata, Mataraki perhaps, those uh, whose appearance marks the start of the Maori New Year. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Um, in the northeast, to the northeast and high in the evening sky sits the bright star at night, brightest star at night, Sirius, in Kansas Major. 
while directly below is Procyon uh, in Kansas Minor. Kansas Kansas Major is uh, referred to as the greater dog, whereas Kansas Minor is the lesser dog. Uh, the Bright Star Regulus is in the northeast, which gives us the scent, uh, gives us the location for Leo the lion, recognisable with his head and mane, making an inverted question mark in the sky. And uh, in the southeast part of the sky, um, as always, the Southern Cross or Crux can be seen in our skies. This time of the year, it sits on its side with the two pointers, Alpha and Beta Centauri, uh, the brightest and second brightest stars in Centaurus lying below. If you are in a dark sky location and can see the vast band of the Milky Way, billions of stars that form part of our galaxy, you and then uh, then you can see the dark cloud known as the Coal Sack uh, sitting beside the Southern Cross. Uh, such interstellar dust clouds are major features of the galaxy embedded in its disk of stars and nebulae. Our visible light view further into the galaxy is hampered by these dense cloud, cold fields of dust uh, but, but fortunately infrared telescopes uh, that can detect heat are better able to pierce the veil of dust and see what lies beyond. In the southwest once again this month if enjoying it from a dark sky site uh, or a dark sky, um, the Large Magellanic Cloud, LMC, and the Small Magellanic Cloud, M SMC, uh, can be seen in the southwest uh, at 163,000 and 206,000 light years respectively. These neighbouring small galaxies have collided or interacted perhaps many times with the Milky Way, leaving streams of hydrogen gas between them in our galaxy. The LMC SMC may eventually be drawn into the Milky Way. Here in southern latitudes, we can easily observe them all year round, uh, whereas from most of the northern hemisphere, they are not visible. Yes, okay. And it was through radio astronomy uh, that this uh, thin uh, uh, stream of hydrogen gas was detected uh, running between the... Uh, between these two clusters, uh, galaxies. So, um, uh, really quite interesting, that one. Uh, okay, at 10.30, how quickly this time is going already. Um, g'day to the folks on the, the Discord channel. I forgot to mention that, didn't I? Um, there's also Discord uh, is running for folks that can join Discord via the ASV website under the Radio Astronomy tab and look for the link to the Friday Night Broadcast. Uh, g'day, Stephen, who's also sent a report in there on an email. Oh, truth. On this day, and I'm just going to ring, ring out a, a handful of these because <clears throat> it's time's getting on. Uh, on the first of uh, uh, it is March, isn't it? Yep. On the first of March, 1966, Verona three crash lands on Venus as the first probe to land on a planet. Um, also on the first of March, 1982, Verona 13 sends the first color pictures of the surface of Venus and continues transmitting data for two hours, well beyond the 30-minute expectation. On the second of March, 1972, Pioneer 10 probe launches to the outer solar system. On the third of March, 1969, Apollo 19 uh, sets lunar tests lunar. A module in Earth orbit for eventual moon landings. On the 4th of uh, March 1979, Voyager 1 discovers the faint rings of Jupiter, with Voyager 2 taking further images four months later during its known flyby of the giant planet. Uh, on the 5th of March 1590, 1590 Tycho Brahe discovers a comet and shows that comets are further away than the moon. Oh yeah. Also on the 5th of March 1979, two probes and a satellite are affected by gamma ray bursts leading to the study of these high energy phenomenon. G'day to John, who's just sent me an email and another fellow as well. <laughs> You're sending emails to the wrong address, but it doesn't matter. They're popping up on my screen. Um, uh, okay, and one more date. 
uh, on the sixth of um, uh, sixth of March, eighteen sorry, nineteen eighty six, uh, Vega One um, makes the first flyby of Comet Halley and returns first close up images of the comet. All right, this is VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria. Let's now just get into a handful of these articles that I've got here. This one, yeah, I don't know whether I'll read it all out, but we'll see how we go. It's just a, a kind of an update on DART, the mission, DART's mission. And uh, there is a, a couple of images here too. Um, all right, um, this is from astronomy.com under the news tab. Oh, and my little pussycats decided to curl up around my legs. Uh, new results from NASA's DART mission confirm we we could <laughs> we could deflect deadly asteroids. Uh, five new studies show smashing spacecraft into asteroids could be a viable way to defend Earth from threatening space rocks. March two, my little cat's meowing at me. Um, what would be sorry? Uh, what would we do if we spotted a hazardous asteroid on a collision course with Earth, you might ask? Uh, could we deflect it safely to prevent the impact? Well, last year, NASA's double asteroid redirection test, DART, mission, tried to find out whether a kinetic impactor could do the job. Smashing a 600-kilogram spacecraft the size of a fridge into an asteroid the size of an Aussie rules football field. Uh, early results from this first real world test of our potential planetary defense systems looking promising. However, it's now only that the first scientific results are being published. Five papers in Nature have recreated the impact and analysed how it changed the asteroid's momentum and orbit, while two studies investigated the debris knocked off from the impact. The conclusion, uh, kinetic impactor technology is a viable technique to potentially defend Earth if necessary. So, small asteroids could be dangerous but hard to spot. And they've got a little, little graph chart thing here which I'll uh, I'll just bring up on the screen um, okay uh, yep, okay so what that's all about uh, our solar system is full of debris left over from early days of the planet formation uh, today some 31,360 asteroids are known to loiter around Earth's neighborhood and uh, what this chart's showing you is asteroid statistics and threats posed by asteroids of different sizes. It comes across okay on the screen there. Although we have tabs on most of the big kilometer sized ones that could wipe out humanity if they hit Earth, most of the smaller ones go undetected. Just over 10 years ago, a 60 foot 18 meter asteroid exploded in our atmosphere over Shalabinsk, Russia. The shockwave smashed thousands of windows, wreaking havoc and injuring some 1,500 people. A 500-foot, 150-metre asteroid like Demimorphos wouldn't wipe out civilization, but it could cause mass casualties uh, and uh, regional devastation. However, these smaller uh, space rocks are harder to find. We think we have only spotted around 40% of them so far, they reckon. So, the DART mission, suppose we did spy an asteroid of the scale on a collision course with Earth. Could we nudge it in a different direction, steering it away from disaster? Well, hitting an asteroid with enough force to change its orbit is theoretically possible, but can it actually be done? That's what the DART mission set out to determine. Specifically, it tested the kinetic impact of technique, which is a fancy way of saying hitting the asteroid with a fast-moving object. The asteroid Demimorphos was a perfect target. It was an object, uh, sorry, it was it was in orbit around its larger cousin Dem Didymos uh, in a loop that took just under 12 hours to complete. <clears throat> the impact from the DART spacecraft was designed to slightly change it, this orbit, uh, slowing it down just a little so that the loop would shrink 
shaving an estimated seven minutes off its round trip. For DART to show the kinetic impact a technique is possible tool a possible tool for planetary defense, it needed to demonstrate two things that its navigation system could autonomously maneuver and target an asteroid during a high speed encounter, and that such an impact could change the asteroid's orbit. In the words of Christina Thomas of Northern Arizona University and colleagues who analyzed the changes of Demimoff's orbit as a result of the impact, DART has successfully done both. The DART spacecraft steered steered itself into the path of Demimorphos uh, with a new system called a Small Body Maneuvering Autonomous Real-Time Navigation, or Smart Nav, which which used the onboard camera to get into a position for maximum impact. More evidence, uh, sorry, more advanced versions of this system could enable future missions to choose their own landing sites to distant asteroids where uh, we can't image the rubble pile terrain well from Earth. This would save the trouble of a scouting trip first. Demimorphos itself was one such asteroid before DART. A team led by Tarek Daly of John Hopkins University has used high resolution images from the mission to make a detailed shape model. This gives a better estimate of its mass, improving our understanding of how these types of asteroids will re- react to impacts. Um, okay, so it's just a few more paragraphs to this. There's another image here. I'll just uh, bring that up. There it is. Go, go. Why is it doing that? Oh, there we are. Okay. All right, so that picture there you see on YouTube and ATV uh, is the dart the, the dart impacted blasted a vast plume of dust and debris from the surface of the asteroid De- Demimorphos and that's just an image of the the, the, the uh, debris that's uh, scattered out it's created kind of like a comet tail to it um, yeah I won't worry about the rest of this but uh, yeah, so there's definitely a technique uh, going on there and it has become successful. This impact with the asteroid did work very well after all. So um, it's, uh, it's quite successful. All right, you're tuned to ASV Radio. Oh, okay. Oh, sorry, what was that? Echo again. Oh, oh, that's it. <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah, that for some reason that audio kicked back all on its own. I don't know why. Okay, um, next in line. Uh, this is a short article. Um, there's evidence of hydrothermal vents in the oceans of Saturn's icy moon Enceladus. 3rd of March, 2023, courtesy of Science Alert. Mystery, silica ejected in huge quantities from Saturn's icy moon Enceladus is powerful new evidence pointing to heat vents on the floor of a global ocean. According to a new analytical model, internal heating from the moon's core creates ocean currents that transport the silica particles which are ejected from deep sea thermal hydrothermal vents that also release heat into the surrounding waters. It's a tantalizing finding that teases a real possibility of the existence of life deep below an alien ocean on an alien world. When the Cassini probe spent its years orbiting and studying Saturn, it made a surprising finding. The planet's E-ring, the second outermost of the extensive ring system, has a composition rich um, has a, a composition rich in microscopic grains of silica alongside the ice waters of ammonia and carbon dioxide. We've also detailed silica particles coming from insulators in the form of icy plumes that erupt from fissures in the moon's thick icy shell. Scientists have determined that the E-ring's composition is supplied by insulators from its rocky core and that the chemistry and size of the grains are are suggestive of high temperatures. But how the silica gets to Enceladus' core, 
up through the deep global ocean to be ejected through the ice in plumes has been something of a conundrum. Enceladus is is quite a wonder. The moon is covered with a chunky shell of ice averaging between 18 and 22 kilometers in thickness, but its orbit of Saturn isn't perfectly round but elliptical, which means its distance from the planet varies, as does the strength of the gravity between them. This varying gravity stretches and compresses Enceladus, creating heating in its core. Below the icy shell, or below the yeah, below the icy shell, uh, therefore lies a global liquid ocean over 10 kilometers deep, and the heat emanating from the core keeps the water from freezing. This also raises the possibility of hydrothermal vents, fissures in the sea floor, through which heat escapes from the moon's interior. Previous research suggested that the heat from Enceladus interior should generate vertical convection currents in the ocean, similar to those seen in on Earth. Now, a team of planetary scientists led by Ashley Scottfield of the University of California has created a model involving those currents to try to understand silica transport on Enceladus. It's like boiling a pot on a stove. Tidal friction adds heat to the ocean and causes upwelling currents to wa- to uh, uh, of warm water. Our what our study shows is that these flaws, sorry, these flows are strong enough to pick up materials from the sea floor and bring them to the ice shell that separates the ocean from the vacuum of space. That tiger shape, the the tiger striped features that cut through the ice shell into the subsurface ocean can act as a direct conduit for captured materials to be flung into space. Enceladus is giving us free samples of what's hidden below. The implications are pretty exciting. As previous research has found, the silica and other materials detected by Cassini in Enceladus's plumes are consistent with what might be found in and uh, at hydrothermal vents. Here on Earth, hydrothermal vents are crawling with life, even far beyond the reaches of sunlight. Entire ecosystems thrive on the chemico, chemo, chemosynthetic food web, harnessing chemical reactions from elements interaction at high temperatures to produce energy, rather than more common photosynthetic processes that rely on sunlight. This has led astrobiologists to suppose that ice moons like Enceladus may be harboring life, even though they are far from the sun, and the ocean floor receives no life giving sunlight whatsoever. The new study adds to a growing body of evidence that suggests that if uh, therm- hydrothermal vents in Enceladus, and if there is life there, then we might be able to detect it uh, without having to attempt to penetrate the ice. An orbiter or lander, of which several are currently under construction, might be able to find biomolecules right uh, near uh, on the Moon's icy surface. Kind of that. Um, So that was courtesy of sciencealert.com. This is ASV Radio, VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel. Uh, Struth. Okay, now, um, this is uh, continuing on from um, a little bit of Dart, uh, the story of Dart, but it's not exactly. It's more to do with the fact that we have four big asteroids are flying by Earth this week. Four big asteroids are flying by Earth this week, but don't worry, they aren't too close. None of them pose an impact risk, and I've got a nice little image uh, um, uh, here to show. Um, <laughs> so don't worry about that image, it's just a, an artist's impression. Uh, <laughs> um, but anyway, what they're saying here is that um, uh, a quartet of large asteroids are zooming by Earth this week, but they'll all pass our planet with millions of miles to spare, according to NASA. The near-Earth asteroids are all passing within 4.6 million miles, or 7.5 million kilometres of our planet, close enough to make NASA a potentially hazardous asteroid list, but none will come closer to than 
um, 3.5 million kilometres, according to NASA. According to our sister's site, Live Science, uh, this week, big space rock flyby flyby start with asteroid 2012 DK31, which measures about 137 metres across. Um, it passed within 4.8 million kilometres of Earth on Monday, February 27, uh, while uh, asteroid 2012 DK31's close approach distance meets the NASA's PHA requirements. The agency has projected its path for the next 200 years and found it won't pose an impact risk to Earth, according to Live Science. Um, uh, the second big asteroid, uh, asteroid, <laughs> that's a good one, astronoying, yes, astronoying, asteroid, <laughs> sorry, uh, a second, the a second big asteroid called 2006 BE55 uh, will fly by Earth today, February 28, uh, and is the one passing within 2.2 million miles of our planet. At 450 feet across, this asteroid is about the same size as 2023 DK31 and takes up takes up to five years to orbit the Earth, according to Live Science. On Friday, March 3rd, two more big asteroids will pass Earth, including the biggest of the week, four close flyby space rocks, flying space rocks. First, there's asteroid 27, 2007 ED-125. It's about 213 metres across, making it the size of a large football stadium and the largest of the week's asteroid flybys. It will be nearly 4.4 million kilometres from Earth during its flyby, according to NASA. The second large uh, asteroid is, is 2021 QW, which is 76 metres across and will pass within 5.3 million kilometres of Earth. There are actually two more asteroids flying by Earth on Friday, March 3, but both are about the size of a large airplane, much smaller than 2007 ED-125 and 2021 QW. One called 2017 BM-123 is 58 metres wide and will pass within near nearly 4.6 million kilometres. So I don't think there's much to worry about. NASA researchers and other scientists around the world regularly scan the skies for asteroids that may one day pose an impact risk to Earth. Space rocks larger than 150 metres uh, with orbits that pass within 7.4 million kilometres of Earth are considered to be potentially hazardous objects. Um, yeah. So that's courtesy of space.com, published three days ago. And, uh, yeah, four big asteroids are flying by Earth this week. There it is. So, um, you're tuned to ASV Radio, VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, and um, I've got uh, a solid report from Tamitha, but what I might show... For you. Oh, yeah. What I might show... Um, where are we? The next article was going to be something about mega constellations. And that's a big article. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll summarize this very quickly. Uh, mega constellations are changing the night sky forever, forcing astronomers to adapt. As companies like SpaceX continue to rush satellites into orbit, the streaks they create are uh, and astronomical images are becoming problematic and I'm going to just bring up this this uh, image here which kind of shows how bad it is um, go across hmm yeah don't know why I'm having problems with that um, okay so there's an image here Starlink satellites photographed soon after launch passing overhead near um, a place in New Mexico. It's a bit of a time elapse image, so it makes it so bad, really. But um, you can see uh, the effect of uh, Starlink satellites as they shoot across the sky, and that's what astronomers are getting their noses out of joint on. Um, and uh, there's another image here, too, uh, which I'll just bring up as well 
uh, which uh, so this is a, a, a picture taken from the International Space Station. So where, where you see all the arrows in that image are uh, uh, actual um, space uh, star, Starlink sa- satellites uh, taken from uh, a picture taken from the International Space Station. So that's that's pretty interesting that they can actually photograph that so clearly. Um, so yeah, it's it's a bit of an issue. And here's one more. I'm just going to like show these pictures because rather than read out the, the article, uh, <laughs> which means you guys need to be watching YouTube or ATV. Uh, but uh, this this is another picture here. Uh, th- this is the first full batch of 60 Starlink test satellites launched low Earth orbit May 24, 2019. Uh, on the night of May 25, more than 25 of the satellites left trails across this image so this this is a, a, a photograph that an astronomer was trying to take of a part of the sky and it was completely bombed um, so to speak uh, by 60 starling satellites that went through the image and completely ruined it so you know it's a, it's it's a, a, a thing and um, and one more image this is actually what they look like close up so it's a funny looking uh, satellite but there it is Anyway, um, that uh, uh, article, it's called um, 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 Mega Constellations are, charging, uh, are Changing the Night Sky Forever, Forcing Astronomers to Adapt. And uh, that's uh, astronomy.com under the news tab. Uh, look for that. And um, yeah, so there it is. Just running out of time to read that. I might, I might even leave it for next week perhaps. Okay, so now um, I'm going to bring up... Um, uh, Timotha and uh, with her little report um, and uh, that uh, should uh, work quite well so let's go ahead with that hopefully. We have multiple big solar flares, a radiation storm and a one-two punch in earth-directed solar storms. The stories and more in the news this week. If you want to learn how weather from our star causes impacts at the Earth that shape the future of our world. Join professors Dr. Jenny Meehan, Michael Cook, and myself as we guide you through a space weather certificate program like no other. To enroll in the space weather and environment science program offered at Millersville University, go to millersville.edu slash swen weather for the 21st century. This forecast also sponsored in part by CW Ops. Space weather this week gets incredibly busy. As we take a look at our Earth facing disk, you can see a lot of regions in the north and in the south, but take a look at the regions particularly in the north because we had a lot of things going on. In fact, back on the 24th, you can see region 3229 firing off an M3.7 class flare This solar flare actually also launched a solar radiation storm and an Earth-directed solar storm. In fact, the halo that we saw in coronagraphs was partially Earth-directed, which meant it was kind of going off to the west. But then another day passes, and late on the 25th, wham, right there, the region once again fires yet another flare. This time was an M6.2 or 3 flare, if I recall. And it was an R2 radio blackout. And this is a, a reasonably large enough blackout that we have to worry about aviation. We do have to worry about those IKO uh, advisories. And on top of that, we had yet another solar storm that was launched along with another radiation storm. This time the chronographs show a full halo. So this one is definitely earth directed. In fact, it should be close to a direct hit. So we've got a one-two punch when it comes to solar storms. We've got stepped up radiation storms that are occurring right now and that are ongoing and will continue to go uh, and and stay elevated until these uh, solar storms reach Earth before things begin to calm down. Meanwhile, we still have a lot of active regions on the Earth-facing disk that are big flare players, and we have a coronal hole that is rotating in through the Earth strike zone and is giving us some fast solar wind to boot. So my goodness, everywhere you look, there's something going on, and that means we're going to have Earth effects both in the day side, the night side, and at the poles. Now, taking a closer look at that solar radiation storm that is ongoing, 
back on the 24th when Region 3229 launched that M3.7 flare, that's when we got our first elevated levels, but they didn't quite reach that S1 level and things have kind of calmed down. But right at the end of the 25th, we got yet another solar flare. This one was the R2 level radio blackout that was a six, uh, M6.3 flare from region 3229. And that definitely pushed us up above the S1 levels. And in fact, for those who are in the know, the spectrum of this particular radiation storm was a bit on the hard side. So that means we actually had some really energetic particles at first. Those have died off a little bit, but we're still sitting above the S1 level and likely that will continue until that second solar storm from that one-two punch hits us and passes us right about midday to late on the 27th. And as you can see, the solar radiation storms really affect the poles. So it, there we have got polar cap absorptions events and these regions can actually have big issues when it comes to GPS reception, also HF radio. So any of you uh, pilots who are flying polar routes Definitely take a look at those ICAO uh, advisories because right now we're going to be dealing with this easily over the next few days. Now, taking a look at our solar storm prediction model, Enlil, this is NASA's version of the model, and you're looking down at the sun's north pole with Earth being off to the right. And for that first solar storm that was launched on the 24th by region 3229, you can see that solar storm being launched off to the west of Earth. Really, it isn't going to be a direct hit but it looks like it's going to hit us right about eh, late on the 26th. But believe it or not, before this solar storm even passes over us completely, we have that other solar storm. This is the one that was launched by the same region on the 25th, a day later. And as that one launches, believe it or not, that is gonna be more of a direct hit at Earth, but this one isn't gonna hit us until about the tw uh, midday on the 27th, possibly late on the 27th. So we're gonna get a one-two punch, with the first hit being sometime late on the 26th, the second hit being possibly, you know, the very next day. And we're going to have that radiation storm that's going to continue all the way through that and then begin to decline. But Aurora photographers, definitely keep your batteries charged because this could be a really good set of solar storms. Switching to our moon, we are now passing through the first quarter phase on our way to a full moon. And by the first, the moon will be about 70% illuminated. So you night sky watchers, if you want to catch some dim objects in the sky and, I don't know, maybe some aurora during these solar storms, you're going to have this bright companion, so you're going to need to check your local rise and set times. Switching to our solar storm conditions and aurora possibilities over the coming week, we are expecting that one-two punch from those two solar storms that are coming toward Earth. At high latitudes, NOAA is expecting major storm conditions. In fact, we're expecting about an 80% chance of major storm conditions starting around the 27th, and it will continue easily through the 28th and possibly continue into through the first of the month before things begin to calm down. So aurora photographers at high latitudes, my goodness, is this going to be a good chance? You couple that with that fast solar wind, and we should get some gorgeous aurora, but you may actually have to look south to see the aurora because the auroral ovals expand so much. Now, mid-latitudes, you know, it's actually not too bad. We are expecting uh, minor storm conditions, but we do have up to about a 25% chance of a major storm on the 27th. And again, the conditions could easily continue through the 28th, but by about the first of the month, the things will probably begin to calm down a little bit. We do have that fast solar wind though that will kind of help uh, you know, enhance things just a little bit. So this is going to be a good chance for war photographers, even at mid latitudes, to get a decent show and possibly have it be sustained. So definitely keep your batteries charged and look for some clear skies. Switching to our solar flare and dayside radio blackout outlook over the coming week, we are sitting about the 150s for solar radio flux, and this is good news for amateur radio operators. On Earth's day side, this means you are in the good range for radio propagation. However, sadly, we are having a lot of big flares. In fact, NOAA's giving us about a 65% chance of an R1 to R2 level radio blackout over the next few days. And this will easily continue until region 3229 has rotated to the sun's far side and it'll drop that uh, risk just a little bit. In fact, an R3 level radio blackout, these are the X-class flares. We do have about a 15% chance of an X-class flare easily over the next three days. And again, 
that risk will drop just a little bit as we move in through the beginning of the month, uh, but not too much because we still have another couple regions like region 3234 and 3236 that are quite, uh, uh, you know, flare capable. Let me put it that way. So we definitely realize that big flares are going to continue to stay on the menu. Now, as we turn to our uh, radiation storm and polar aviation outlook over the coming week, know that we are in an S1 level of uh, uh, radiation storm right now. And this is easily going to continue for the next few days as those big solar storms hit Earth. We won't have anything really calming down until those solar storms hit Earth and begin to pass Earth. That's when they, the storms can begin to calm down. However, because of region 32, uh, uh, 29 that's rotating to the sun's west limb, we are having a, an, an elevated risk of additional radiation storms. In fact, about a 15% or 20% chance of additional radiation storms over the next few days. And that's going to calm down probably next week. So sadly, if you are a pilot, please be sure to check those ICAO advisories often. And if you're a high risk passenger, please take this into consideration in your flight plans. So the space weather this week is very exciting. We have those one two punch from those solar storms. The first solar storm is going to hit us probably late on the 26th. And then the second one will hit us somewhere midday on the 27th, possibly late on the 27th. And that means we could be storming until easily the 28th before things calm down. So Aurora photographers, definitely keep your batteries charged. We could get Aurora well into mid latitudes and it could last over a long period of time, along with that fast solar wind that we're getting from that coronal hole. So it's almost like a perfect uh, opportunity here to get some decent shots as long as the weather holds out. Now, you amateur radio operators and emergency responders, well, I know we've got a lot of radio blackouts right now. And in fact, we just had an R2 level radio blackout and the risk for radio blackouts is pretty high right now. And you're just going to have to grin and bear it. Plus, we've got those solar storms that are going to be hitting on Earth's night side and that causes problems for you, too. Just remember that on the day side, switch to higher frequencies on the night side, switch to lower frequencies when that solar storm hits and you'll be able to ride through this. OK, and now GPS users. Well, it's not looking so great for you. You've got a lot of stuff going on on the day side and now we have solar storms at the night side and we also have radiation storms at the poles. So this causes problems for GPS reception pretty much all the way around. And you're just going to have to hunker down and definitely uh, watch yourself, especially near dawn and dusk or near anywhere near Aurora, because that does cause issues for reception. And of course, if you happen to be a drone pilot, be sure to calibrate your magnetometers often and be careful with uh, your GPS reception and any pilot. Also, make sure you check those ICAO advisories. I'm Tamitha Scove, the Space Weather Woman. Thank you for watching. <laughs>
and uh, I do have an image of that as well. Okay, so it's fairly intense. Uh, there's no, it's 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 um, it's still low energy in the in the green region. Um, it's uh, but it, it's a fairly good lobe, so to speak, out towards uh, the mainland. So um, uh, potential for uh, any uh, uh, um, auroral activity low on the horizon, I would say. Um, okay, going back to solar weather, space weather. Um, there is, and uh, there's another image here of our solar cycle. So, uh, as you can see from the new graph, uh, where we are on the scheme of things. Uh, solar cycle update. February was another strong month for the solar cycle 25. According to NOAA, the average sunspot number was among the highest of the past 10 years. Uh, originally, forecasters thought solar cycle 25 would be about the same as solar cycle 24 one of the weakest solar cycles in the century february sunspot numbers are the latest sign um, that solar cycle 25 will exceed predictions in fact solar cycle 25 has outperformed the official forecast for more than 24 months in a row solar maxima is not expected until 2024 or 2025 uh, so the solar cycle has plenty of time to strengthen even more, bringing additional X-class flares, geomagnetic storms and auroras. And uh, there's a, a nice little picture here of an aurora taken just recently as well. Um, there we go. And uh, that's quite a... Uh, if, I, <laughs> if I ever saw anything like that over Melbourne, I'd, uh, I'd be very, very pleased. Um... A high, a huge aurora swirling like crazy. This, this was, um, uh, this was not in the forecast during the early hours of March third. A crack opened in the Earth's magnetic field. Solar wind poured through the gap, sparking a light show over Finland. So, how's that for a uh, an image? Eh? It's pretty good. All right. Um, next, there is. Uh, that's about it, really. Um, pl the planetary. Um, K index, uh, KP is 3.33, qu considered quiet. The 24-hour max KP figure is 3.67, which is also considered quiet. Um, and I think that's about it. And uh, as of the 3rd of March 2023, uh, there are 2,331 potentially hazardous asteroids, which I sus suspect include those four mentioned before. <laughs> All right, um, spaceweather.com. Thank you very much, Lee, for all that information. And um, I think that concludes uh, tonight's uh, session. Um, and uh, also, uh, just to mention that the um, um, that uh, the Mount Burnett Observatory is having a, a stand at the Avalon 2023 Air Show, um, which is happening this weekend. Um, so apart from looking for all the aircraft going flying overhead and doing all that, uh, yep, look out for the Mount Burnett Observatory uh, stand, uh, which they will have. Uh, all very good for them. Um, so you've been listening to VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, the official station of the Astronomical um, Society of Victoria with a regular Friday night broadcast coming to you from the studios of VK3 CSJ in Narry Warren South and uh, I thank everybody who's called in up there on the email uh, Don and Stephen uh, and uh, John um, and um, uh, Mr. W and uh, <laughs> and to everybody who's uh, b been on the chat window there uh, Kim, g'day Kim Cassiopeia, Nebs um, Martin, VK7JIH and uh, I think there was Remus was there as well. Nice picture of um, uh, M42 there. I think, is that is that by you there, Andrew? Um, VK3BQ put up a picture there of M42. It's quite good. Um, and uh, I think that's about it I can see there. And Richard VK3VRS as well. Yep. All right. Thanks, guys, for the coming up on the chat window. All right, we'll uh, shoot across to 80 metres now and uh, see if there's any stations that uh, wish to uh, to check in on tonight's session. Um, this is VK3 EKH uh, listing on 3541.
Well, that's a nice uh, group there. Uh, I might have one or two call signs wrong. Uh, VK seven J, sorry VK <laughs> VK three JR, um, VK three GL, VK three TJS, uh, VK three VIN, VK three I think it was VK three ABX. I'm not hundred percent sure on that one. VK three JH. Uh, VK3SPX and VK3KIS. Was there anybody else? Oh, super weak. Uh, yep, there was uh, got VK7JH, and there was one incredibly weak station with a little beep on his on his uh, audio. I heard that. Uh, just try again that other station. Uh, VK3 Bravo something. Oh. Righto. It's Andrew. VK3 BQ. Very weak. Aren't, aren't you a suburban chap station? You should be much stronger, Andrew. All right. We'll get to you. <laughs> it might be a bit of a struggle. Um, sounds like you might be out camping somewhere with your telescope, perhaps. Anyway, across to you there, Frank. VK3 Juliet Radio. VK, you were the first one I heard. VK3 JR. VK3 EKH. Ah. Uh. Thanks, Frank. VK3JR. VK3 uh, EKH uh, returning. Very good. Excellent uh, signal from you. And uh, thanks for the, uh, for the report. And uh, yeah, I, I, I tend to agree. I think um, uh, even if uh, Tamitha's reports don't quite... Um, if, 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 you know, if, if they don't fall on a, on a Friday where I can actually, um, you know, they, they predict for next week, they're still, uh, still worthy to listen to. Um, she's a live wire <laughs> when it comes to reporting the solar flares. So uh, it's always uh, an interesting uh, report that she gives. And for those who are fairly HF active, uh, active then uh, it, it also allows to confirm um, how the conditions have been over the last uh, week or so by uh, listening to that uh, report as well. But yeah, no, thanks Frank. Good on you, mate. Excellent stuff. Uh, across to you there, Graham. VK3 Golf Lima. VK3. to it. Uh, there was this uh, eerie glow. Uh, my wife and I, I was 
Wellington, uh, down in uh, Hobart. Um, there was uh, the pictures from up north in Stanley. Um, there was pictures uh, put up by someone in Bright in Victoria, in northeast Victoria. Uh, some photos put up by a person who was up near Dubbo. Uh, was able to see some, certainly some colour in the sky and on the horizon. So it certainly was a bit of a show the other night on Tuesday night. Um, as far as the, uh, the, 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 the cap activity was concerned down south, um, I, I noted that you put the picture of the current activity, which I think is about 3 or 3.4 or something like that, the index at the moment. Uh, the other night the index was up at 6.8, 6.9, um, around about 10, 10.30 in the evening. So she certainly was, there was a lot of red uh, on the graph and it was uh, quite spectacular. So I really, <laughs> I suppose of all nights, of all nights it had to have, down here in Bunyip, we had to have a little bit of white, wispy, high-level cloud cover, which prevented us from seeing anything perhaps a bit more spectacular. So, um, so there we go. I uh, also noted uh, the 10 metre activity and some interesting effects from the rural uh, solar storms earlier in the week on 10 metres and 15 metres. Um, some, uh, some interesting uh, effects on signals on there, that's for sure. All right, anyway, thanks for the, the broadcast tonight, Dick Clint. And if I get a chance at the end of the broadcast or your call back tonight, I might have a little bit of a chat if you're uh, free. Um, but if not, we'll possibly catch up with you. Uh, over the weekend sometime. And for anyone else who's listening to the callback session tonight, um, I'm heading across and will be uh, uh, trading with my usual stuff that I have for sale um, over at the uh, Werribee Hamfest on Sunday. So uh, if any of you guys are heading to the event, pop over and say good day. All right, back around to you there, Clint. VK3, uh, VKH, and the uh, group VK3GL. Thanks, Graeme. VK3GL. Uh, VK3CSJ returning. Thank you for the re, uh, the report, and uh, you're a mightily good signal yourself. There's a great big fat uh, SSB signal occurring just up the band. It's within my band uh, band scope. I'm not sure who that is, but it's quite strong by the looks of it. Anyway, not causing any problem here. Um, yeah, okay, Graeme, look, thanks for sending that report. Uh by the time I, I read your text message, though, it was, uh, I think, fairly late in the evening. So uh, I, I missed the opportunity to um, to go out and, and see if I can see anything myself. Uh, but uh, I, I would say, um, given the strength of uh, solar flare activity occurring uh, and the fact that we still haven't quite reached solar maxima, solar the aurora australis is going to be quite a common thing <laughs> so if i if i miss this opportunity to, to to actually see any of this aurora activity here from from the mainland over these next uh, 12 months or so i i don't know i just give it away as a bad joke i guess anyway all right no worries mate thanks very much for um uh, sending the message anyway um i just need to keep the phone near me i suppose thanks graham um uh, Jack, VK3TJS Shepherd and VK3EKH. Good evening. Yeah, thanks, Jack. VK3TJS, VK3EKH uh, returning. 
Yeah, I haven't been to uh, um, a ham fest for myself for a, a quite a long time, actually, so um, I'm uh, definitely missing out, I think. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, uh, as you say, yeah, Graham had a good time uh, across there, and um, I'm sure you'll uh, 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 sell a few things there with your uh, table that you'll have set up for sure. But, no, thanks, Jack. Um, your signal's not as strong... Uh, this uh, this Friday, as it was uh, last week, quite good last week and the week before, um, but just a little bit weak today. But doesn't matter. Still, I'm still here. Still hearing you. Thanks, Jack, um, and thanks on the the video report too. I think you said that you, you're watching it on uh, the YouTube channel as well. Um, okay, across to Ian VK3VIN Kangaroo Flat VK3EKH. Go ahead, Vin. VIN, VK3 EKH. Yes, a little tricky to hear you, uh, Ian. I, I caught bits and pieces of it, and uh, at one stage you completely disappeared. Now, I don't know whether it was uh, atmospheric conditions or whether you, you had a problem, uh, but uh, yes, you, your signal completely disappeared, and I was <laughs> wondering if you'd put it back or not. Uh, but I waited, and then you came back through again. So, yes, I, I heard something about the Aurora. And uh, something about um, uh, uh, the um, um, Tamitha's transmissions uh, on, on the solar report as well. But uh, yeah, your, your, your signal was a little bit down tonight. Uh, my, my noise floor is hovering around S9 uh, plus, and uh, you're just above that. So yeah, it's not, not like it was the, the last previous weeks. It's a bit, a bit different tonight. Anyway, uh, thanks again, Ian. Um, and. Um, uh, we've got you in the log, so to speak. <laughs> Alright, um, now the next station, I'm not 100% sure of the call sign, but it sounded like ABX. The K3 ABX, I think. The K3 EKH. <laughs> I'm 
VK3 AVX, VK3 EKH, I think you said the name was Aaron. Um, yeah, well, good day, Aaron. Your, your signal's not uh, um, not uh, not so good here either tonight, uh, sorry to say. Uh, audio is a little bit muffly. Uh, it sounds a little muffled. Needs uh, needs a bit of highs in it. Would, uh, would really help. <laughs> um, but you're, uh, you're about S9. And that's competing with my noise floor here. My kingdom for a low noise floor. Honestly, uh, it would be so nice to uh, to get out of suburbia and, and have a noise floor that's far lower. Just have to be uh, patient on that one, I'm afraid. But yeah, sorry, Aaron. Uh, signal's not uh, not 100% here, and the audio is a bit muffled. It's um, it definitely needs a few highs in it, but. Uh, Maybe um, uh, Steve get, was able to pick you up a bit better, being a bit closer. We'll come to you in a minute, Steve. Thanks, Aaron. Anyway, um, next station was VK3JH. I think it was Juliet Hotel. I should know that name. Anyway, VK3JH, VK3EKH. Uh, 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 maybe the call sign wrong. VK3 Juliet Hotel, are you there? I think it's Ray. No, okay. It's alright. 